Hello and welcome to another episode of SAC Town Talks. Today we've got a great show planned today. We have Mary Creesman with the League of Conservation Voters joining us today. Mary, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. You know, Mary, could you give us a little background, I guess, on, on the League of Conservation Voters and kind of what you guys have been working on? Yeah, so um, the California League of Conservation Voters is actually the oldest grassroots environmental organization in the nation. Um, we got started early 1970s um, and really our niche has been for the past 40 plus years, how we build the power to move on environmental and climate issues. Um, and that's really our sweet spot. That's what we've been doing. It's about accountability. It's about elections. Um, it's about transparency. It's about voter mobilization um, and advocacy. And so that's really our sweet spot. What, what we really look at is, and I think this is no more true ever than right now, um, we have the solutions on the climate crisis. Um, we know how to make clean energy. We know how to better manage our forests and our landscapes. Um, we know how to transform our communities to be more resilient to heat, pollution, wildfires, drought, flooding. Those are things we know. We don't need to crack those codes. What we do need to do is build the power and the political will to make these changes at the rate and scale that science tells us we have to, to preserve our future. Um, and that's what we are just laser focused on, is how do we find, um, support, elect the boldest possible climate justice champions um, who represent all of our communities? Um, how do we help them be successful? If they're not, how do we hold them accountable? How do we translate what's happening um, in federal government and state government to voters on the ground, to community members on the ground, um, and do that full circus, circle accountability and support work? Very interesting. I guess, you know, I guess, how did you get involved with the league and kind of in this line of work? What's kind of your background? Yeah, I actually, um, I actually came to this work through kind of economic justice. Um, I, you know, having to do with kind of how I grew up, um, have always been really driven um, towards uh, social justice, um, whether it's gender justice, whether it's racial justice, equity, uh, economic justice, and really saw economic opportunity as that unifying factor around justice. And so I got started in the labor movement as a union organizer, um, uh, the Labor Federation in Silicon Valley, um, and ended up being the political and organizing director there and uh, helped lead a lot of different both electoral campaigns, but also um, policy campaigns from things ranging from affordable housing to living wage um, to uh, contracting out to big box retail um, uh, uh, kind of limitations um, and worked on a lot of different issues around all of that. And uh, then I kind of got an opportunity to help lead an organization called Green for All, um, for anybody who's familiar with that organization. It's a national organization working on the intersection of uh, race, environment, economy, um, and really kind of working to build an inclusive green economy uh, that lifts people out of poverty. And I initially went just to help with the transition, a leadership transition, and then just really got sold on um, that intersectional mission of how interconnected these issues are and how if we are going to solve them, we have to approach them with solutions that are interconnected and intersectional as well. Um, and really began as, as committed as I am to organize labor and the labor movement um, as uh, the, you know, the key piece that lifts, that lifts communities out of poverty and families out of poverty. I think the climate crisis is our, our best tool at scale um, to address the inequities we have in our economy right now and to address racial justice and to address public health issues. And so that's really what brought me uh, to this movement is just um, the understanding of, look, this is all so deeply connected. And if we, if we act on climate the way that we need to and at the scale that's required, it means transforming our infrastructure and our economy and it gives us a huge opportunity to do it right um, and to fix the, the injustices of the past. Um, so that's really what brought me to this work. Um, and if you, know, if 
you've done electoral work and then you haven't done electoral work, you also know that doing advocacy without um, helping people get elected and working on elections is, is like trying to make change with one arm behind your back. Um, they're two parts of the same coin. Um, right. And we're not going to get bold lawmakers in office. Uh, we're not going to get bold laws passed unless we have bold lawmakers in office who understand these issues. And so I would say, you know, that's what really brought me to CLCB is that understanding that all of the policy development in the world is not going to make the change we need. Um, it's really power building and electing the right people and empowering communities. You know, I guess that's really interesting kind of you know, talking about your background and kind of here we have 2020 where, you know, all these intersections have crashed, right? We have, you know, the climate crisis, you know, we have fires everywhere. Uh, you know, we have uh, racial issues coming up left and right uh, and inequity issues, you know, being brought forth by the virus. Um, kind of, you know, you said that there's solutions to all this stuff, you know, through the kind of the green, green movement. Kind of, I guess, any details about how, you know, you really see this coming through and kind of help solving some of these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple different ways we think about this. Um, but first is just all of the infrastructure changes that we need to make are also essential to creating jobs and promoting public health and correcting environmental injustices of the past. Um, and so that's kind of how we, you know, when we look at something like how do we transform our transportation sector, right? Um, transportation is the largest carbon emitter in our state, in the country. Um, and so what we have to do is we have to move folks to clean vehicles. We have to radically expand transit, make transit more affordable and equitable. Um, we have to expand active transportation, especially um, for short and midterm trips. Um, and all of that, that creates jobs. That should create opportunities. Um, and if we do it, we should, right, we should be focusing those opportunities and those jobs, um, making sure they are union, and also focusing them on um, Black Indigenous communities of color um, who've got burned the brunt of an economy that has not been equitable. Um, and so that's the opportunity we really have. When you look at something like uh, buildings as the second biggest emitter of pollution contributing to the climate crisis that everybody's feeling right now, uh, we need to transform our buildings. Um, not only just to electrify them, um, but also to help help uh, adapt to what our current climate reality is around air pollution, extreme heat, all of that. Um, if you live in a community that hasn't had to deal with that in the past, and there are communities who've been dealing with toxic air for generations, let's be clear, bearing the burden of our extractive base economy, you know that you're quickly having to figure out how do you live in a place where it's never been this hot. You may not have air conditioning. Um, you can't go outside because there's smoke, um, but you also uh, are too hot inside. Uh, and so this is just the reality that we have to transform our communities and that's jobs. Um, and it, it should be, you know, there, there's a huge opportunity to create um, cost savings for end users and communities with these changes as well. Um, so those are a couple examples, but even when we think about our forest management, um, there's a huge worker pipeline issue. When we think about restoration um, and better forest management needed across our landscapes um, to help us make us more resilient to wildfires and to uh, support our landscapes to be uh, the, the carbon sinks they can be by pulling pollution out of the atmosphere and combating some of our other sources of carbon emissions. And yet we don't have the workforce. We don't have the pipeline of workforce ready for that. That is, that, that's an extreme amount of jobs that are available to us. And an opportunity, again, for us to create jobs, make our, our communities and our landscapes more resilient um, to the climate impacts happening, and advance public health at the same time. Um, and so that's the opportunity our state has, that's the opportunity the country has, the world has, that not only do we have kind of an urgent mandate to make some changes, but we have an opportunity to actually uh, recreate what our future could look like to make it more just and sustainable at the same time. Interesting. You know, the last couple of weeks, you know, Governor Newsom has come out with some, you know, uh, executive orders kind of targeting some of these things you're talking about. One, you know, elect, you know, mandating electric vehicles by, what is it, 2030, uh, and, you know, conserving, I guess, 30% of the state's land, um, you know, for future generations. Can you kind of talk about your thoughts about, you know, those two executive orders and kind of how they uh, fall in line with what you guys are, are working on? 
Yes, I am so thrilled to talk about those. And those are huge steps forward, really significant. And I would say, you know, I, I've used this line a couple of times, but uh, those are, they are significant by anybody's standards. Um, whether you look at other states, other countries, um, the steps that this administration just in the last month and a half have taken um, are, uh, are, are incomparable to what other countries and states have done. And yet they are also not sufficient and comprehensive and complete. Um, we have a lot more we have to do. They are an important down payment, but we are behind. We are severely behind. The legislature has done nothing uh, significant and bold on the climate crisis in the last two legislative sessions. Um, and the reality is the action that the governor took uh, just recently is um, really making up for lost time and implementation we need to do here. Um, again, the changes we need to make to all of our buildings, to all of our transportation, to our infrastructure um, is, is pretty significant. And uh, we're behind on that. It's gonna take an infusion of stimulus money into the economy. Um, it's gonna take uh, addressing things like transit that were not included in the governor's executive order. Um, it's gonna take policy to help enable and implement all of these actions. Um, it's gonna take policy to ensure equi equi equity and affordability in all of this. Um, for underserved communities. So there is a lot still left to be done. And there are huge sectors that haven't been tackled, um, like plastics and pollution. Uh, the legislature right. has tried twice. And it is, it is infuriating to me that our legislature was not able to get this done. And the connection between climate change is so crystal clear. This is a climate issue, period, full stop. Um, there's issues around workforce transition. We have workers who've been working in extraction industries for generations powering our state and our lives and now we need to transition from that and the government is going to play a really significant role in creating security and taking care of those workers those who transition to other careers and those who don't um, and that is something that we need some urgent attention from our government um, and our communities on that should be regionally customizable so there's a lot left to do. Um, we got to think about our, our, our drought that's, again, we're in a cyclical drought cycle, a lot to do with our watersheds that are being impacted by wildfires really burning those areas right now. So these fires are going to impact our water quality and supply as well. Um, so a lot left to do, but these executive orders are, are really significant and important. Um, and my hope is um, that the legislature follows up and gains that momentum as well. Um, and that uh, the administration doesn't slow down, that these two are just the beginning, um, because we are at a, at a point where we have to use all tools at our disposal to make the change that's going to protect our future. Yeah, just to kind of touch upon, I guess, the one executive order that would mandate, I guess, 30% of the state be held for conservation. Uh, can you kind of explain, I guess, the, the details on that? Is, is Would that mean that, I guess, 30% of the, the state would remain in, I guess, a natural habitat and there wouldn't be any building? Um, I think they said that maybe like roughly 25% of the state is already in that state. Um, so it'd be actually adding maybe 5% more. Um, can you kind of explain, you know, I guess, you know, what, how that benefits the state and why that's important? Yeah, so um, conserving lands and water, and it's really important that coastal and ocean areas are part of this too, are hugely critical um, to our climate solution strategy. And what is, what is really powerful about these natural solutions, our landscapes, our vegetation, our soil, our working lands, um, if done right, our agricultural lands, um, our forests, our waters, coastal areas, um, is that they are the triple, like the triple threat to the climate crisis. And that not only do they sequester carbon um, and, and actually pull, it's like magic, they pull pollution out of the air, right? Like they can right. clean up our air. Um, they also uh, help help adapt against climate impacts. So they make our communities, our regions, our landscapes, as we protect areas, make us more um, resilient to the climate crisis. Um, trees and uh, vegetation and water actually cool ambient temperatures. They fight against extreme heat. Um, they protect communities. So they're key for sequestration. They're key for resiliency, adaptation. They're also key for mitigation, um, to mitigate from what's happening. Again, if you are 
you know, if, let's say Sacramento, Sac Town talks, if you're walking down the street in a hundred plus degree heat in Sacramento and then one side of the street has trees, the other side doesn't, you know right. what side you're walking on. It is extremely cooler on the side with trees because of shade, but also because of the general cooling elements of that. And so we see that uh, having cooling communities also is an important mitigation strategy uh, to getting folks out of their car and creating more mobility options and accessibility for communities. So these, these strategies, leaning into natural solutions in our climate crisis are essential piece of the puzzle. Um, we cannot tackle the climate crisis without leaning into natural solutions and natural infrastructure, full stop. Um, and so part of what this is, is yeah, I think we're at about, I think we're either five, I thought it was 8%, but five or 8% below this 30 by 30 goal. Um, and we've got more to do. We've got to make sure that we are balancing the fires that have happened across the state that, you know, these areas used to be um, before they were burnt. Uh, really important sources of carbon cleaning. Now they aren't, and we need to conserve some other lands as a result. We also need to make sure as we're doing this that we have cleared no development zones. We should not be developing in wildfire areas, period. That needs to stop, and that can be part of the strategy as well. Um, so this is important, but part of what makes this important and makes the executive order important is that it, it will have a ripple effect. Um, there's been, there's not been another state or our country hasn't signed on to this 30 by 30 goal, but it's something that's really been discussed collectively internationally. Um, and California putting the stake in the ground, drawing the line and saying, look, we're just going to do it. It's time. It's way past time. We got to get it done. Um, is really going to uh, have an important kind of leadership impact on other states, um, countries, and hopefully the nation as well. Um, and the same with the executive order on transportation. Uh, the power of California's kind of market um, share being the fifth largest economy in the nation or in the world is that when California makes a shift and says, look, we are putting a line in the sand and saying clean cars, nothing else after 2035, um, it makes car companies, it makes the market change business. We are too big right. of a market for those companies to do something different for California than they do for the rest of the world. So this is going to have global impact. You know, an, an interesting thing you've top, topped on was the wildfires. You know, that's something we've been dealing with the past four years. Uh, you know, just when we think you, there can't be another fire because everything's burned already, there there is one. Uh, and they seem to be getting worse and worse every year. Uh, and it's kind of, I guess, boiled down to a lack of forest management. Um, you know, it's, I guess it's been stated that a lot of this is fev federally owned. Um, and then kind of, you know, why aren't these forests being managed and kind of what are what's kind of stopping, I guess, the federal government or the state government from going in there and I guess, you know, clearing the forest so, you know, these fire dangers, you know, are mitigated. Yeah, yeah it absolutely is. Climate change is absolutely at its core, but also our forest management. And since this has been largely unregulated, that's what is the source of this. I mean, we could point to companies, we could point to logging, we can point to the forest industry. The truth is, this is the role of government. This, I mean, this is the role of government. We are in a crisis, we have been in a crisis, we've known this crisis is coming, um, and we know what these solutions are. Indigenous communities have engaged in prescribed burning um, for generations. Uh, we, it's not that we don't know what these solutions are. The truth is we need a government that's gonna stand up and say what companies or private landowners or the federal government does on our land in California has broad, wide-reaching impacts on our livelihood, our, our air quality, um, and our ability to stay in the state. And so it's really the role of government to say in this moment, um, no more. We have to change how we are managing these landscapes and how we are investing in these landscapes. And we need to do more in investment and also create incentives, subsidies, and regulation um, that protect the public good. Because what happens on an you know, what happens on federal land, even though it's not state land, has impacted the entire state and other states and other countries um, because of the smoke and the air quality. Um, so it's time for, for the federal government or for the state government, hopefully the federal government after November, um, to say we're changing the way we are managing our forests, we're changing the way we're managing our landscapes, um, and we're changing where they are on the priority list too. 
Um, our landscapes are typically, they, this was not a big investment under the Brown administration. We are hoping it becomes a bigger investment um, under the Newsom administration, but our landscapes are, again, they cannot be ignored as a central piece of the puzzle um, to this work. You know, something you touched on earlier was recycling and kind of I think the interesting thing upon recycling that we've all learned recently is there really isn't much of it actually happening. They're collecting it. The plastic's just sitting there. Uh, it's been shipped to other countries. A bunch of it's end up in the ocean. Uh, and it, you know, it turns out that it's just cheaper and easier for, you know, companies to make new plastic. Uh, you know, it's made from petroleum. Um, so it's it's easier to make new plastic than it is to, I guess, recycle existing plastic. Kind of, what's the answer on this this plastic issue that you know seems to be growing out of control? Um, is it simply not using plastic, or you know, is it is is recycling really something that's uh, achievable? Yeah. So this one is just it, it's kind of killing me a little bit in my soul because we had two really good bills and two attempts in the last two years um, by Assemblymember Lorena Gonzalez and Senator Ben Allen, SB fifty four, AB ten eighty. Uh, to move away from single-use pla uh, packaging. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to move. Yes, there are some issues on the recycling side. Recycling is not dead. It's still alive. It still needs to happen. But what we need to do just as, as critically is we need to move away from single-use uh, packaging across the board. Um, and again, there is plenty of science and data out there about how plastics pollution is contributing to climate change. It is there. It is real. This is part of it. Um, and it has a real impact um, on the air we're breathing, um, the reality we're facing around wildfires and drought and the rest. Um, and this goes back to my point before, this is about the role of government. Um, this is about government saying, look, this is killing us. Literally, the way we have designed our packaging is killing us. The way we have done our urban design and community land, land use is killing us. The way we've, we've powered our towns, our cities, our transportation is killing us. These things are killing us, so they need to stop. And that's the role of government. And that's why it's so heartbreaking that these bills failed. They should be, they should be a no-brainer in a state like California dealing with what we're dealing with. Um, and yet they failed. Um, and they failed largely because of interest, uh, industry interests. Um, flooding uh, legislators, districts with ads that are misleading, um, tying this to, to something that's just not real. Um, and so this it just speaks to the power of industry and politics right now that our government has just not led um, in a way that's going to really protect our communities. You know, I guess another issue we're dealing with is this kind of green energy transformation uh, as you mentioned, you know, the legislature hasn't done anything in the last few years. Maybe the last thing they did was what SB 100 uh, mandating 100% uh, renewable green energy uh, in the future. You know, I guess how attainable is that now? And, you know, a lot of those things we're hearing about is there's a lack of storage for these uh, existing green energies. Kind of what are you seeing, I guess, in the storage space and kind of what's, what's the an answer in moving away from fossil fuels? Yeah, and the thing about that, you're right, that was like the last big moment was SB 100 and by 2045, and then a couple months later, we found out from the UN Climate Panel that 2045 was even too late. We need all of this by 2030 and front loaded. Um, so not only was our kind of big marker um, most recently uh, uh, not, not aggressive enough now based on what science tells us, um, but in in actuality, we haven't done much to move that forward yet. We have a lot to do to implement that. I think the governor's own words are uh, goals are dreams without plans. And, um, you know, Governor Jerry Brown um, and Senator Kevin DeLeon um, worked on that right before uh, they transitioned out of their roles. And now we're in a place where um, the planning, the implementation on those, to a, a large extent has not happened. We still have a lot to do to make, um, to make that a reality. Uh, and so I think that's the thing, these goals and these markers, we have to actually do implementation and get more aggressive and change what we believe is possible on this stuff. And I think, you know, a lot of the conversation is, but can we, you know, can we do clean transportation by 2035? Can we do this stuff by 2045? And the truth is we have to. Our lives depend on it. The lives of our children and our loved ones depend on it. Um, and we can. 
Um, I really believe that, you know, our strength and our resiliency and our ability to change is significant. Um, and again, it's the role of our government to really drive that. And we, we saw that with COVID, right? We saw a government that really mandated changes to protect lives. Um, and we need to see that with the climate crisis. Like we've got to, we've got to flatten the climate curve essentially, right? As we heat up and things get worse, we got to flatten the climate curve. And it means we all need to do stuff, but companies need to do stuff. The government needs to catalyze that change. Um, so, you know, I would say that uh, SB 100 is um, important. It's there, it's a marker. We have a lot of work to do and storage is one of the key things um, we've got to think about. Um, in, uh, and again, it's, it, it's, it's not something that's not crackable, it is, um, but we have to be serious and aggressive on how we are growing that capacity within our state. Yeah, like, you know, we've had all these, um, you know, record high temperatures, uh, a lot of hot days here. We've, you know, come back to rolling blackouts and kind of, I guess, the narrative out there is, oh, this is kind of the result of green energy and we're not ready for it. Um, kind of what are the what are the storage solutions to, to make this, I guess, green energy thing a reality, I guess, yeah. now instead of in 20 years? Well, first of all, it is a reality. We have more people employed by solar and wind in the state of California than extraction industries. Um, so it's not about making a reality. It's about completely transitioning um, because it is more of a reality than the other sources at this point. Um, second, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss on this show. Am I allowed to cuss on this show? <laughs> we could put a warning out if you want. Yeah. <laughs> That's bull, S-H-I-T, um, that clean energy is uh, at all a part of those rolling blackouts. It's not true. There's plenty of reports and data um, from government and from private industry showing that that's, that's just not the case. Um, that's a red herring um, from the oil and gas company who know this isn't, you know, those companies know this is an existential crisis for them. They see the tea leaves, right? As California burns, as we enter a new drought, as all of this happens, the political will is going to shift from them and their resources, the millions and millions of dollars they have to spend on propping up candidates um, that support their issues, on um, kind of uh, 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 spreading their propaganda to voters is not gonna matter as much anymore. I mean, we just finished statewide polling, focus groups across the state that show that voters are as eager as ever to see their candidates lead on climate action. And this is across party lines. Um, the air quality, the fires, um, these are things that are people's top three issues, if not top. Um, and that we even saw across party lines um, that voters are more likely to support a candidate who doesn't take money from oil and gas, and that's at 79%. 79% of voters are more likely to support a candidate who does not get money from oil and gas companies. And that's because they know what that means, getting that money. And they know what oil and gas companies have done to our state. Um, so the, the voters are there. Voters are there probably even farther um, there than, than our legislators are. Um, but we have work to do to kind of uh, continue to, to support our elected leaders to lead on behalf of the public good and not be as uh, impacted by money and politics from these companies. Yeah, it kind of parlays into my my next question. You know, with election coming up, you know, where are voters on this? You know, st uh, nationwide, it seems like it's kind of a contentious issue. You're seeing Supreme Court justices now being questioned on climate change and and things like that. Have we have we made a, a you know a turning point where you know a majority of people now believe in climate change and see it as an urgent issue in in their politicians and kind of moving forward? Absolutely. We do regular polling and focus groups. We did a round of polling and focus groups right after the 2018 midterm elections. Um, and we saw for the first time, really, um, climate and the environment jump to top three issues for folks. And this is really, I mean, it, we don't have to manufacture urgency on this issue anymore. The urgency is there. Climate, climate crisis is here now. So this is not something that's far into the future. This is something that now makes the list of daily worries and concerns for communities. Um, and so Part of what we're seeing, and we saw it even more this last month as we did it, increased polling um, and focus groups, is that voters are there. They are eager. What they are 
here's what they're most worried about. What they're most worried about is that their leaders um, do not see the solutions on this. They are clear on what the solutions are. They can tie transportation. They can tie forest management. I mean, voters really can tie these issues uh, to the climate crisis. They tie climate change to wildfires, to heat, to droughts, drier, hotter, burning. Um, they get those things. Those are not things we have to tell them. They know about that. Um, what they're concerned about is if their legislators, if their elected leaders are really going to lead or whether they're just tied to corporate interests. Um, that's, that's what they're worried about is whether we're going to see change at, at the, the scale that's needed. Um, and so we're, we're hearing all of this from voters and part of our key job as an organization is to translate these results up to leaders and say, look, here's where voters are. Why aren't our leaders reflecting this reality? What's going on that what where the voters what the voters want and where they're at is so different from the action and the rhetoric we are seeing from legislators. Um, and then the other thing our job is to do is to hold people accountable um, and say, look, if you're if you're not representing the public good and what your constituents represent and want, then we have to call you out and hold you accountable. And an example of that is Assemblymember Jim Frazier, who chairs the Transportation Committee. Um, he has been the biggest single obstacle to change in the transportation industry um, in the state of California, um, which is our biggest carbon emitter. And him sitting on that committee and killing bills year after year that would move us forward and save lives is unacceptable. Um, and it's a time in which we need to call for a change there because we can't afford it. We cannot afford any more years of of no leadership on these issues. Um, we won't survive it. You know, that's kind of pretends in my next question is, you know, what, I guess, which, which races are you guys looking at and, you know, who are some of the candidates you guys are, are supporting and, uh, you know, looking to get into office here next year? Yeah. So we do some independent expenditure stuff and we do some coordinated campaign stuff. So I can share a little bit, but there's some I can't totally share. Um, but one of the things that's really important to us is um, we have a lot of strong champions in the Senate who are termed out, who've been termed out, um, and the Senate needs more leadership on these issues. Um, that we are we're focused on a lot of candidates in those races that, that could really help us out there. Um, and then on the assembly side, we have some great um, candidates in some swing districts that we're working with and supporting um, and engaging to help make sure they win. Um, if you, you know, there's a, a few, I, I'm, I'm a little scared I'm going to leave somebody out and I'm going to hurt one of our candidates' feelings here, so I'm not going to name anybody because I'm a little afraid folks will be like, why did you mention me? Um, but there are some great ones on the assembly side and I think some chance to really actually um, transition some non-green seats to green seats. Um, some non-environmental votes to environmental votes. Um, my hope is, and I'm going to knock on wood, um, that we can celebrate after election day some changes there. Um, I think uh, on the Senate side, I'm hopeful as well. Um, some of these Assembly and Senate candidates are really um, being helped out by some strong congressional leaders as well. Uh, there's some of the congressional seats that we worked to help flip in 2018 um, who are, are strong and getting a lot of resources and support. And so the candidates down ballot from them um, are, are doing well as a result. Um, so we're seeing some promise there. Um, but there's, you know, there, there's a lot still to be done. So if you're interested in learning how you can get involved, I'm going to do a little uh, check out www.ecovote.org and under our endorsements, um, let us know if you want to get involved and, and we can plug you in um, to help with the, the key battleground districts, Senate, Assembly, Congressional across the state. Okay, great. And I guess, you know, one more thing turning to 2021, you know, you've mentioned a couple pieces of legislation uh, dealing with re recycling, but, you know, what else are you guys looking to accomplish uh, in the next session, uh, you know, dealing on these issues? Yeah, I think we're going to have to see some economic stimulus. Um, as the small businesses, uh, 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 SBA loans start to, to um, uh, run out, and the support from the federal government starts to, uh, again, go away, I think we're going to see the economy, the economy continue to take a hit. Um, and part of what our state government's role is, I think, in this moment, is to figure out how to support the economy. 
And again, as I said before, our goal and what our government really should be doing, because um, you should do multiple things at once with the same public dollars, that's called efficiency, that's called being smart, is we should be investing in things that not just create jobs, but advance racial justice and equity with those jobs, advance public health, and protect our future from the climate crisis and prepare for what's happening right now. And all of the solutions that I talked about, those have to be front and center to any type of economic recovery. We're gonna be working on that in the federal level, we're gonna be working on that in the state level, um, but it's gotta be essential to that strategy. And we should really be doing all at once when we look at racial justice, public health, jobs, um, and climate action. Um, these investments do all four if we do them right, if we do them equitably and inclusively. Um, and so that should be the focus. So we're gonna be working on that. Um, I think we're also really going to need to look at some additional transportation um, uh, legislation to implement some of the great uh, kind of markers the governor put in place around clean transportation. We also really need to look at transit, radically expanding transit. That is key to mobility for communities. I'd like to see transit become free. Communities deserve that. That's what that, that should look like. Um, we also need to look at buildings. We talked about electrifying our buildings. It's gonna be really critical. And we need to continue to look at our landscapes. We need money to conserve more land. We need money to restore the land that has been burnt. We need money to better manage our forests. Um, and all of that creates jobs. Um, and so really hoping to see uh, a spending package around that as well um, that could likely go to the ballot um, as well. Uh, so those are all gonna be things that we're really uh, looking at. I think just underpinning all of that um, are, are two critical things, both our workforce transition and democracy. And I mentioned kind of we need strategies um, within regions that are customizable to regions to thoughtfully and securely trans transition our workforces. We have communities that have relied on extraction um, for decades. It's, it's the government's role to partner with labor, to partner with academic institutions, um, to partner with companies to attract different jobs to the region. Think about training, think about communications, think about how to uh, transition workforces around some of this and create security, economic security for workers impacted. Um, and those have to be regionally relevant solutions um, that local leaders are leading on. Um, so that's going to be critically important. And then democracy. We're an organization that is so laser focused on democracy because we know we are not going to change what's, ha what's happening. We are not going to change what's possible in the climate crisis unless we address part of what got us here which is a broken political system. Um, and until we really adequately and equitably break down barriers to voting, um, we won't have the right leaders in office and we won't have uh, people power strong enough to make the change it's gonna take to protect us all. Um, and so we're, folk, we're sponsors of Prop 18, but yes, I'm Prop 18, which helps uh, young people vote in a federal election cycle, worked on Prop 15, 16, 17. Um, all of those are critically important measures um, for democracy and for the future of our state. Um, and so we're gonna continue to look at democracy issues as well. You know, I think uh, you guys may have talked about this previously, but. Um, in, in March, one of our biggest primaries ever, we had about 38% of eligible voters turn out to vote. Um, that's a failing grade. In any school, in any class, 38% is failing grade, pretty severely a failing grade. Um, and we should be embarrassed by that number, embarrassed by that number. We have so much we need to do to make a really representative democracy. Prop 18 helps us get there, um, and we have more we need to do to make sure um, that people really do have the power versus corporations. Well, it sounds like you got a, a busy year ahead of you, Mary. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. If some of our listeners want to find out more information about you or kind of your group, what kind of what's your your social uh, taglines where we can find some some more information? 
Oh my God, you're gonna see now you're 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 quizzing me over here. What's our so okay? So go to our website and then you can find all of our social media taglines. They're not all consistent, unfortunately. But if you go to www.ecovote.org, right at the top, you'll see Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Um, and you can follow us there. Um, Charles Clayton on our team does a great job on those channels, keeps it very interesting, makes some great graphics. So uh, join us and, and yeah, we'd love for you to also sign up just to get our newsletters, our updates, our actions. We have 150,000 members across the state um, who are very active um, and really are our people power. Um, they help us do work to, to mobilize and hold leaders accountable and spread the word and organize their network. So um, join, the, join the climate voter team um, and help us get this done. We also have nine local leagues across the state who we partner with um, from places like Valley Voters for the Environment and Health in the Central Valley to the Inland Empire League of Environmental Justice Voters to the LA League of Conservation Voters, the San Francisco League of Conservation Voters, um, nine, nine leagues across the state that are working to create that pipeline of just really representative climate champions um, at a local level on up. Um, so a lot of ways to plug in. You can plug in with those leagues. You can plug in with us. Um, and we're happy to facilitate either. Well, thank you for all the work you're doing, Mary, and, and keep up the good work. And uh, we'd love to check in with you uh, in a few months to talk about, uh, you know, next year and how you, things are working. So thank you so much, Mary, and good, good luck in November. Thank you. Good luck to all of us. Take care. Thanks for listening to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Make sure to like and subscribe on your YouTube page. Hit that notification bell or rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. Thanks to our producer, Phil, today. Vernon's off on vacation, so no thanks to him, and we'll be back to you on Friday. Some are called dreamers. Wow.